are listening to the Bat Flip Podcast, a baseball podcast from Belly Up Sports and the Belly Up Podcast Network. Here are your hosts, Damian and Matt. Welcome back, everyone, to the Bat Flip Podcast. My name is Damien here with my co-host, Matt, coming to you on April 26th of 2022. Uh, so we have a pretty fun episode today. It's a little different. We are doing a joint episode with the MLB Daily guys from the Belly Up Sports um, podcast section. We are, you know, we are a Belly Up Sports podcast as well. They reached out. They wanted to do a collaboration uh, so we made this a joint episode, so we're kind of doing this intro. You'll hear it jump over um, to basically them kind of leading off the, the conversation. We talk about the lockout since we haven't talked to them in a while. Um, Miguel Cabrera getting his 3,000th hit. Um, some of the kind of things going around with the, uh, the White Sox and how they've struggled so far this season. Uh, and just a couple other little housekeeping things about Jacob DeGrom and, and uh, Michael Conforto. But uh, before we get into that part of it, how are you doing, Matt? I'm doing great. Uh, it was a really good conversation with them. I, I definitely enjoyed doing that. Um, and uh, but yeah, this week, it, everything's been good. I um, went to my first baseball game of the year on Thursday night last week. Uh, minor league game. Went to see the, the Birmingham Barons play. Um not a whole lot happened with the. There's a few pretty good prospects in that game, but not a whole lot happened. Uh, but uh, it was it was fun to be at the ballpark and going to try to get back to a bunch of ball games of of all kinds. You know, co- go through the summer. So, um, but yeah, everything's been good. Uh, did a lot of fishing this weekend. That was a lot of fun. So, <laughs> yeah. So basically, you'll hear now um, that it's going to jump into that section of it, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Welcome back to MLB Daily, your one-stop shop for daily baseball content. I am LJ LaFura. Alongside me, I have Brandon Karam. I also have from Belly Up Sports' Bat Flip podcast, Damian and Matt. We are all Belly Up Sports podcasts. We are all what they aren't. Guys, I'm not 100% sure I was supposed to do our intro, but we can cut that out from here. How are you guys doing? Doing well, doing well. Uh, we'll uh, we'll just work around it. We're going to tell our, our listeners that it's a joint episode anyway, so they can just hear both of our intros. It'll uh, it'll make them a little happy. And of course, your listeners will uh, already know this information, but why don't you guys uh, introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, tell our listeners a little bit about your show? Um, basically, we're a weekly baseball podcast that upload every Tuesday night slash Wednesday morning, um, hitting on basically the biggest news throughout the week. Um, we try and give you a little bit of a different perspective than what the general baseball show does. We like to, to kind of get a little bit more in depth on the kind of numbers that aren't quite used as much. We use more of like, instead of just for how many walks he has, like walks per nine, you know, strikeouts per nine, just the per nine stats um, while also keeping it kind of easy for, for listeners to follow along with. Um, and I don't know if you have anything else you want to, you want to explain with it, Matt. Oh yeah. We just, uh, you know, we talk about just kind of the big topics of baseball of the, of the week and, uh, you know, just kind of go over, uh, you know, our thoughts and opinions on everything. And, uh, you know, some of our really good opinions, like the fact that we said Corbin Burns was really good before he became really, really good. And some of our bad opinions, like Damian picking francisco lindor to win mvp last year listen um, we don't need to bring that up right <laughs> we can also mention that i picked blake snell to win the cy young hey yeah that was pretty bad too but uh we have some good takes but um we don't i guess just dogging our dogging my co-host on our show uh while we're trying to advertise their show to other viewers probably not the best thing to do but <laughs> we have a lot of fun and uh, we have a lot of good takes too so um we're uh definitely uh you know we enjoy doing it. It's a weekly, just kind of a weekly topic based show. So, yeah. Well, on the other end, of course, um, we are Belly Up Sports' daily baseball podcast. Every single day during the season, Brandon and I get together for about a half hour and we talk about what's happening that day, all of the news stories of that day, everything that we can possibly get into a 30 minute show, we get in that day. And it's been, Brandon can attest to this, it's been quite a fun experience to be able to, you know, really get to look at the league on such a deep level. I think we're also one of the more analytically based shows running. 
we certainly have been up on the curve on that with a decent balance on that stuff as well. Very similar to the way you guys have. So, yeah, I mean, if you're looking for daily baseball content with forward thinking minds about baseball, certainly fun chemistry, you got to turn to us. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, to add to that, you know, we, we are more analytically based. Um, we love stats like OPS plus WOBA, uh, weighted runs created plus war but also we're like big into the eye test too we we understand that those stats while they're great starting points they don't tell the whole story and being able to watch games i mean i'm a i'm a yankees fan lj's a red Sox fan so there's always great camaraderie back and forth between us regarding those two teams especially when they play each other and um it's it's overall like a great a great balance um we try to touch on as many different players and teams per episode as we can some episodes are more heavy on uh, Yankees and Red Sox content as we're obviously more well-versed in that. But we, we enjoy just uh, talking about really anybody. And we both play fantasy baseball. So, uh, yeah, we, we uh, you know, just, you know, having the opportunity to sit down every day and just talk for a little bit, get your mind off of whatever you're doing. We're both college students, so being able to sit down, talk about uh, the MLB for a little bit uh, is always one of the better parts of my days for sure. Absolutely. So this is our first, um, you know, little daily, weekly baseball belly up sports summit of the year. And this is the first time we've talked to you guys in it's, it, it's been a hot minute and it certainly has been a hot minute since the lockout. We haven't gotten to take any of your guys' takes on that. Where do you guys want to start? Uh, Rob Manford should be fired um, like, <laughs> like 20 years ago before he ever got into baseball. Um, but overall, I mean, I think it was a, a step in the right direction for the players. Um, overall, they the general body of work, they made gains in pretty much every area they wanted to. Um, and, you know, it sets it up for in the next, you know, four or five years when the when they start negotiating CBA again, that they can start making a swing for their bigger, bigger ideals that they want moving forward. But um, it, it didn't need to go as long as it did it could have easily been done and without the media fair but overall um you know i think it, it ended up working out and i'm glad that we were able to get the lockout in time for us to have a full season yeah i was i had a pretty similar opinion to that um you know i think a couple of the things i really harped on on our show uh one was the the media issues uh with just both sides going to the media about everything trying to win the when the uh, when the newspaper win the podcast, uh, and I thought that that really didn't help anybody. It really just hurt the game in general. Uh, but the fact that they got it done before the season started, and or, or you know, and still have the ability to have a full season. I guess they did delay a week, but uh, the ability to still have a full season, uh, you know, that was a success. I think the players won some things that you know I was a little surprised they actually won. Um, and uh, you know, the the one thing that you know kind of worries me going forward is it seems like they gave in a little bit on some of the day-to-day -day rule stuff. I know the universal DH is, is widely accepted and, and I don't have a problem with that, but some of the more, um, you know, radical rule changes that they've talked about the next couple of years, um, I'm a little worried about how that's going to look, but for the most part, um, you know, the fact that it got done when it looked like it was not going to get done before it, without canceling a bunch of games, was I think at the end of the day was successful because you know I think for the last year pretty much everybody had thought you know the way that the sides were trending was that there's no way this actually gets done before the season and we're going to lose a bunch of games so the fact that we didn't is, is a big time success so um you know good on good on everyone for actually making it happen at the end of the day but some of the some of the media stuff and the rhetoric was kind of a clown show so that's kind of my thoughts on it but yeah, again, I think, you know, we're, you know, we're talking about a difference of like two weeks that could have made a huge impact on not just this season, but the future of baseball. Like this, 100%, the negotiating that took place and the amount of stalling that happened in it, this, the whole negotiation could have been done by the end of December. There's no doubt about that in my mind. And now you're looking at a two-week window of error where 
this gets held off two more weeks, you start losing more and more games. The second you actually start losing games, you immediately lose fans. You immediately have people turning away from the game, and that's already happening at a record rate for baseball. They need to fix that. If it's with some of these rule changes, I'm all for it. Honestly, some of the stuff, we can definitely dive into that in a minute. I think they could have been a little more um, aggressive, a little more proactive with those types of changes. But I see America in a very interesting place where they're kind of desperate for a summer sport that's really going to engage them. And at the same time, you can't deny it. You've got sports like a, particularly soccer is really starting to grow in America. And you could see it balloon in the next four years. You're talking about a World Cup in the United States in 2026. So all of a sudden, if you give people a reason to stop watching baseball, they're going to turn to something else. And having that good an alternative right next door is really bad for baseball right now. So they're very fortunate that they got this full season. Yeah, I mean, I agree with with what LJ said. Um, Obviously, the audience of of baseball seems to get older. Um, They've been doing a lot to try to get the younger people involved, you know, through all their stuff that they do on on like uh, on their their uh, social medias um, and such. But um, you know, for the people that that are diehards like us, of course, we're we're not going to stop watching the sport. But it's all about getting the casual viewer involved, and I think it's been really interesting to see some of the stuff. You know, even the last few years that we've seen, like even with the baseball. I mean, I'm pretty sure I saw the other day that guys are hitting the ball harder than they ever have, yet home runs are down like a drastic amount from when we saw the juiced ball in 2019. And it's all about, you know, at the end of the day, while you do want the sport to be the fairest, it's entertainment. Sports are entertainment. And you want to put the best product out there on the field. And I don't know if the lockout, um, you know, advanced that. In any way, sure, adding the the DH for the National League will help with the offense a little bit. And it's early, and the bats do heat up in the summer. But it's, it's just been interesting to see, you know, how it's how it all transpired through the off season. I mean, there was some weeks there where it felt like LJ and I were basically saying the same thing over and over again um, on our show. Like it's just there's no, zero, you know, there there isn't anything that was was a going on. So. Um, you know, I think overall, obviously it's a, it's a net positive for the sport that we are able to have a full 162 games, um, and of course full playoffs and now with the expanded playoffs, but, um, really interesting to see where the league's going to go, um, over the next few years and how they approach that next CBA. Yeah. And, now, and, and like you guys had mentioned, um, and I'll, I've mentioned a lot on my show and I'm, we'll, uh, I'll keep it short here, but um baseball needed to get this done now like before the season before they canceled the games coming from the 2020 season where we had the the whole covid thing and we weren't sure we were going to get games and then we had the 60 game season and the the players and the owners bickering so much and then we came back to the 2021 season and had one of the best seasons of baseball in recent history you had the emergence of a guy like shohei otani who's only going to help you know grow that game worldwide you had the the Blue Jays become a really fun team that allows Canada to get back into baseball. You had Vlad Jr. Be, you know break out to what everyone thought, and you allow you know people who were fans of Vlad Senior from the Montreal to the Angels to everywhere to have another player to connect with. That if he was your favorite player and he went away, um, it, it just 2021 was such a good season moving forward in baseball, and the momentum it had going into 2022 you couldn't afford to lose games. Um, and you know, that I've, I've said that a lot, but it, it really, the, the timeline of them getting it done and being able to keep the full season. And I feel keep that momentum moving where we don't go backwards. Like we were in 2020. Yeah. And again, you talk about backwards when this, this sport goes backwards, it goes backwards very rapidly. And now I guess to uh, segue a little further into the CBA, looking at some of the more specifics, what in particular got you guys very heated? Um, I can start with this one. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I got super heated about a specific topic. Um, I was a little bit frustrated with the. I, I thought that there were a lot of times that 
there are, there are a lot of negotiations with the numbers stuff like you know the 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 bonus pool for pre arm players and the um and the uh and the luxury tax thresholds that it just seemed like offers that were getting thrown out by each side were completely useless and pointless. And I got a little heated about those because if you're going to make an offer, why, why even bother if you're just going to say it's the same thing or even go backwards on it? You know, um, I thought that that got a little heated maybe for me, uh, maybe the, the expanded playoffs a little bit too. I really don't like the idea of expanding the playoffs more. 12 teams was, was okay, I guess. I, I think 12 teams will work out well if we expand the league by two teams, which is a possibility, you know, go to 16 teams, that 12 team format should uh, fit pretty well. Kind of like how the NFL format used to be before the, before they expanded. But sometimes, you know, they were talking about 14 out of 30 teams making it. That's too much. Um, and that, that was something that I definitely had a pretty strong opinion on, but um, you know, and, 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 you know, we can go into it more if y'all want to, but just kind of the, the rule changes that we're looking at in the future stuff like i really don't think they should be banning the shift really i, I really dislike the shift ban uh stuff like the pitch clock I, i'm cool with that that bother me stuff like the you know the automated umpires even though some of the technology can sometimes act up in the when they've tried it in the in the independent league games and stuff they've had some issues with it in the past um, you know, I think that they can make some advances on that, that technology to where that would work out well, but I really don't like the shift ban. I don't think we should be telling, I think you should have nine players on the field and you they can play wherever they want to do, but, um, you know, that's just kind of my opinion on it, but, uh, but yeah, some of, some of these rule changes and, and it, different issues, uh, you know, some of them are pretty important to me and some of them aren't. So, um, but, um. Uh, but yeah, definitely, definitely the the lack of movement when they were just stagnated on numbers and throwing out the same thing every time, and then some of those rule changes were I was pretty heated about. Yeah, um, I'm gonna before I let Damian jump in here, I didn't just didn't want this um, conversation point to come to pass because overall I'm very supportive of banning the shift for really I mean ultimately two re three reasons. First off, it's an entertainment medium. And if this is going to be able to get things to be more, a little more entertaining without completely jeopardizing the value of the sport, then I'm probably going to be in favor of it. The other thing is the fact that, you know, you're talking about keeping two people on every side of second base. You can still do a pretty effective shift in that regard. If you have to have everyone, if you have the shortstop, if you're shifting right and you have the shortstop basically hugging second base, that's going to be a pretty effective shift as well. But let me also put it to you this way, Matt, and I'm actually really glad that I don't remember where I can credit this to, but it was the most sensical rationale for banning the shift. You look at every single other major sport, you know, you talk about soccer and hockey, they both have their offsides. You have uh, five seconds in basketball where you can't hold the ball in the paint, you can't hold the ball in general. And then, of course, you have only certain formations in football that are legal the side of the sport that has the ball normally has some restrictions as to what they can do in order to make it a overall competitively balanced, competitively fair game for the side that doesn't have control of the ball at that point in time. So ultimately that piece of logic there was what ended up doing it for me. Yeah. And I, uh, go ahead, Damien. I was going to say, it, I think sort of without, without getting too in depth into it the that's the thing i really did like about baseball is that you didn't have that which every sport does um baseball doesn't have a clock like that's why i hate the implementation of a pitch clock like you have your 27 outs each team's gonna get unless you you know you're the home team and you win so you don't need those last three like what are, are we gonna draw a line from the back of second base just like to the outfield grass and say like oh you can't pass that or like or we're telling infielders like hey you have to have make sure your two feet are on the on the dirt you can't be on the grass like i'm not an, i'm not a fan of that either um you, you did mention they can do a dramatic shift still they can i just if they can still do that then why are we worried about making a rule of banning the shift like i think it just it balances things out a little bit more uh, uh, it's, a, it's a slight alteration it's a slight alteration but is it really going to change anything not not really because the you know the the second baseman can still play there and you're gonna have the shortstop still right there so they can still take that whole side of the field away 
Um, yeah. And we're just seeing it pre-pitch. Yeah. Well, um, I was going to add one other thing too. I think part of, you know, the, the, the cool, one of the cool things about baseball is over time, things are just, people, teams adjust, players adjust, you know, we've had for, you know, baseball's been around for, you know, 150 years and, you know, over time, you know, players adjusted to different things like for example in the you know in the in the 90s you know you had like guys like greg maddox who started pitching all these speed contact guys were, were coming in and slapping the ball around all over the place these guys started pitching you know trying to pitch east west and get the ball on the ground because they knew that you know they were going to swing at pitches and make contact and if they could make make them make bad contact they could get them out and then of course these players started hitting launch angle because you know if you're throwing the ball down in the zone you start learning how to pull the ball and hit it up in the air, you can start hitting a lot of home runs. So, you know, you kind of look at, um, you kind of look at those adjustments and then eventually, you know, with those, all these high fastballs t- teams are throwing, um, you know, you could maybe get, you know, maybe teams, some players like, like the Nick Madrigal types start to become more valuable again. It's kind of one of those things that's cool is how it adjusts over time. And, uh, you know, I'm not the one sitting here saying, well, if you don't like the shift and bunt, or if you don't like the shift, just slap the ball to left field. But, you know, it's kind of a give and take of the sport. It's a strategy move. And I think taking away that strategy move and that give and take of the sport hurts in general. It hurts the strategy of it. it, it there's a lot of things that, that I don't like about it. But um, I get the other side, too. I know that, you know, player that a lot of fans, especially a lot of casual fans, you know, they want to see the – the players go up there and rip home runs and they want to see them swing as hard as they can every time. And, you know, if they pull the ball and pull the ball through the hole, you know, it's, it's successful hit. But I think some of that positioning and strategy makes the game, uh, you know, it really helps the game. And, um, you know, especially with the fact that they took out, you know, the ability for managers to have any impact on the game when it comes to like, you know, the, the DH and stuff. I, I was, I was in favor of the DH, but, you know, there's there's a lot of strategy that's been taken out of the game, regardless of whether it was good or not. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, this is one thing that could keep in there and probably a good thing. So but uh, we'll see what ends up happening. I think they're going to move to banning it. So it probably doesn't matter what my opinion is anyway. <laughs> but uh, definitely just kind of it's an interesting conversation because there are two really good, good thoughts on it, good sides on it. So. Well, Damien, did you have anything else that got you heated during the CBA? Um, I think the only thing that really Matt made great points. I mean, we talked in depth about that stuff and had rants on our show. Um, I think the only thing that really he didn't mention that that kind of got to me was that the owners kept deciding at the last second to throw little things in to try and jumble it all up like, hey, here's pretty much a deal, but then drop your lawsuit against us um, or you're not going to get this deal like you drop your 300 or however big million dollar lawsuit it was against us because of all of this. And then we'll give you the deal that you guys want. Um, and if not, here's like a drastically worse deal because you don't want to drop your lawsuit, just little things like that. And, and we've seen other little things where owners were throwing other things in at the last minute or, or making an offer at like 2 AM in the morning, hoping the players would just be dumb and tired and accept it. Um, just, just little things like that. Um, but, but like he said, with the – and the other thing is pushing for the the 45-day rule implementation thing. Like, oh, we're only going to give the players 45 days, and we can unilaterally implement a rule. Like, I didn't like that either. Um, you take away from teams on how they're building a team for the year if you're going to change rules. Um, and just in general, like, the players need time to adapt to certain rules – as well um, through their off season training and what people are focusing on. Absolutely. And we saw that with um, glass now last year when they started to move away from the um, sticky stuff and like, and he was trying to figure out how to throw without it, seeing he didn't done it so long. Brandon, did you have anything to add in this situation? No, I completely agree with what, what a Damien said, you know, it was, it was crazy. Cause there was those nights where, they're up till three in the morning. They meet 18 times or whatever it is. And it's like, okay, here's a deal that it's almost everything that you want. But then we're going to put some stuff in the fine print that, um, you know, we're hoping that you don't read. It was just, it was just kind of a shady move by the owners. Um, I mean, the owners, you know, at least a lot of them are not the 
greatest people when it comes to owning their team. I mean, we see like Oakland's owner, like that guy just refuses to spend money. The fans don't want to go to the games. The Reds owner, you know, we see the fans with the bags over their head the other day. Um, And it just led to a lot of uh, tension that could have been easily avoided. Like, sure, I understand that when you go through like a CBA, it's not going to be cut in stone and there's going to be stuff that you don't agree on. And that's, that's the whole point of it. But to just like be very like sneaky with it and stuff like that. Um, I, I, I uh, totally agree. I was not, um, a big fan of that whatsoever. Yeah. Y'all make, y'all make real good points on that. Uh, definitely. But Hey, uh, I do, we, we do have another topic we want to talk about real quick. And I think, uh, it's kind of, I kind of want to get away from this all sad doom and gloom stuff. Mm-hmm. If y'all want to talk about Miguel Cabrera. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So, yeah, uh, you know, I was really excited this week for Miguel Cabrera to get his 3,000th hit. I, I thought that was really cool and something we probably won't see again for a while. So what is that, what's everyone's thoughts on that? I, I thought it was really cool. Um, I mean, from our perspective, I mean, we're both 20 years old. Miguel Cabrera is our childhood. Like, oh, this- yeah guy was ridiculously good albert Pujols was ridiculously good and now you've kind of you've seen both of them hit the highest peak that they could ever be asked to hit both of them so it's really great i think to for us to see it to be able to see it at this age and you're right you talk about never um not sure when we're going to see it again I think we could make a really good case that we're not going to see it again and anything like that again in the next decade. I think Nelson Cruz hitting 500 home runs is probably our best bet. But past that, we're looking at the guys that are just coming into the league now are the ones we're hopeful we'll be able to get to 500 home runs, 3,000 hits. Like, it's going to be a long time until we get there again. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the there was a list that came out the other day on, you know, kind of percentage odds on the, who's going to be the next to hit 3,000 hits and like some of them on there were like Wander Franco, Vlad Jr., Ronald Acuna Jr., some of these young guys that, you know, Juan Soto, some of these young guys that are, uh, you know, probably a, a ways away, but um, from, from that. And uh, I thought it's definitely interesting that, you know, like it's, it's probably going to be a while. I mean, if you look at like the current home run, uh, you know, obviously Nelson Cruz needs 49 more to get to 500, which, I mean, I guess it kind of depends on if he plays two more seasons, you know, including if he plays next year, has a good year this year, plays next year, he could maybe do it. But I mean, the next guy on there is John Carlos Stanton, and he's got to hit 151 more. Is he? I don't know if he's going to stay healthy enough for that. And um, you know, Mike Trout's on there, 314. He needs a pretty good bit. He's still got definitely got time to do it, but you know, he's also got the injury injury history. So I definitely thought it was interesting on, on that. And then on the 3,000 hits. Um, you know, that's going to be tough because, uh, you know, we don't have – I don't think we have really anybody that's that close on, on that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, uh, so so I'm, I'm looking at the active hit leader list right now. The first, like, maybe realistic option is Jose Altuve, and he's at 1783. Um, and then if you go down to the, probably the next realistic option, that's when you get to Machado and Mike Trout, um, and they're both at 1,400. Um and at at the ages of 29 and and 30. So they're, they're probably the most realistic options, but, you know, with Altuve needing 1300 or or 1220 more hits, um, you know, you're looking at close to 10 seasons if he, if he hits 200 per season. Okay. Yeah. And I think really um, it's a um, very good situation or not, not a very good situation, excuse me to be in where you're having this problem where, you know, we're talking a decade plus until we get to the highest peak of the sport. Again, the question becomes, why is that? I think that really comes down to three or two main topics, but three topics total one, no one is making contact at the same rate that they used to. And that's another, another reason I wouldn't, I'm not fully bought in on it, but I wouldn't be opposed if they ever said, all right, we're going to move the mound back. Like, I'm not entirely opposed to that because I think you look at the two um, sides, the pitching and the hitting, there is a physical cap to bat to ball skill. Like hand-eye coordination is only going to be able to come so far, but pitchers are becoming stronger and able to do more with their, with the ball every single year. So at this point it's outpacing, the pitching ability is outpacing the hitting. 
And I think you also might get a better quality of product with moving the mound back as well, but that's not really the real point here. Either way, you're not making contact at the same rate. You can't hit those home runs. Players also aren't playing a full season anymore. You know, you're talking about even the best players, you're getting 150 games out of them each year. And that takes out a good chunk of hits out of their career that they would have had in another era where Iron Man were, was being an Iron Man was more of the norm. Like now that that's gone, it's, um, it, it's really hard. And then as for guys, like, I don't think Soto has a chance. I don't think Trout has a chance to get to these spots because they walk too darn much. Yeah. Yeah. That's what's... Yeah. It, it's become, it, it's become now in the game where hits and it, it's, we have a running joke with one of our friends in our chat that hits don't matter. Um, that it's basically on base now. So it doesn't matter if you are a 250 hitter, if you can walk a good percentage of the time and then you still end up having a 380 to 390 on base, like you're looked at as a good player and like a really good player. And then if you add that you are, are making, you know, 25 to 30 home runs on top of that, you're looked at as one of the upper echelon players then. Um, like the, the, the art of batting has really kind of gone away. But I think what it's what we were kind of talking about when we were talking about the shift and stuff, a, a change. This is kind of one of the way baseball shifting one way there will be eventually be a time where it's shifting back. Like at least as far as like power hitters, they're going to realize like, Hey, we're not able to hit as much because of the, the pitchers, um, you know, getting stronger. They're making velocity more, the movements becoming nastier. Like there's going to be a time where, contact becomes this that situation that people are looking for again rather than the power because if you can make contact with a guy who's throwing 100 your chances of getting a hard hit ball are are way up rather than you trying to swing out of your shoes and put all your power into the ball itself um that's where you're going to hit you know more weak hits actually because you're trying too hard and you're not squaring the ball up enough um so you're going to have that the analytics part of and the whole like towards health and you know players health and not becoming so bravo and and macho now i think that's gonna stay like you're gonna see players you know make sure hey i'm a little banged up so can i can i get a couple games off back to back that's not gonna change but i do think the change in philosophy of of maybe going back to a contact based hitter will will come back in in at least into light more often within the next 10 years and I just wanted to touch on real quick, just how, you know, when, when you, when you look at the 3000 hit mark, you know, in my, uh, lifetime and like really the last 10 years. So of course there's only 33 players to have ever got 3000 hits, including, uh, Cabrera. And in my lifetime, I've been able to see Derek Jeter, Albert Pujols, Adrian Beltre, A-Rod, Ichiro, and now Cabrera all get to the 3000 hit mark. I feel extremely like lucky, I guess, in a sense that I've been able yeah. to see that because I don't think there's ever been like a time span in baseball where in such a short period of time we've seen all these guys get to 3000 hits and it, you know, I'm not opposed to, you know, not being able to see these guys get these these records and these hits now because you see all the young talent around the league, guys like Acuna, Soto, um, even a guy like Bryce Harper, who has been a pleasure to watch. Um, and then you look at guys like Tatis and Wander Franco, these guys who are just so young but have incredible skills at the plate um, that we're really in a good era of baseball, I think. And it's only going to get better as we watch these guys flourish into perennial superstars. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with y'all on, on all that. And I think that, uh, you know, one thing that it kind of gets lost is that, you know, I think the accomplishment is, is, is huge. But I think a lot of the priority of that accomplishment is lower than it used to be. As, you know, more players are we're going to have a lot of players in the 500 home run club of players that are there now. Uh, that are playing right now. Uh, they might be a little while before we get another one, but there's go- there's going to be a lot of them. Uh, but when you look at like when you look at the 3000 hits, it, it's you know, it's going to be a real special thing when you have one like because I do think if he stays healthy, Wander Franco is a guy that's going to do it. I mean, I think he will. He's that type of player. He's aggressive. He doesn't strike out. You know, he I doesn't like walk time. an awful lot, but he's going to be the guy that he's going to get. He's going to get a lot of singles. He's going to get a, he's going to hit for power, too, but he's going to get a lot of hits. He's just the great, great bat control. Uh, I, Vlad Jr. is kind of the same way. 
he's going to get a lot of hits. He gets a lot. He's a real. He, he's not as contact oriented as as uh, Wander Franco is. Vlad Jr. doesn't strike out much. He gets a lot of hits. He hits a lot of home runs but he's not a big strikeout guy. So, you know, we're going to have some eventually. It's just kind of out of the current. And, of course, we didn't have this this huge influx of these guys coming up at 20 years old, too, until recently. Like, you know, there was like four or five years there where we didn't really have that many, like, super big-time, like, 20-year-old prospects. And now it seems like there's three every year. Like, this year you got, you know, the Julio Rodriguez, Torkelson, Witt, all three being, like, 20 years old. You know, we've had Acuna, Soto, Franco, all these – Guerrero, all these guys over the last few years. This, is, this has kind of been a last five years thing that we've got these guys coming up at 20. So that's another thing too. You know, those guys might not be playing 162 games a year, like maybe like Iron Man, like, like Cal Ripken Jr. or somebody would have played, but they're going to be playing 150 a year, hopefully, uh, barring injury. And, you know, starting at an the age as they're starting at, if they continue to be productive, which with talent level, they probably will, you know, they'll be playing long enough, even if they have a, a lower rate total of, of hits per, per season. Um, you know, I think they'll, I think, I think there'll be more than get there than, than you think, but uh, definitely it's, it's such a cool accomplishment for Cabrera. And I echo the fact that we got to see so many of them, um, you know, in, in our childhood and, and growing up. And, um, you know, I, uh, I think that's really cool. So, uh, definitely, uh, definitely excited to see who the next one is, and even if I might be, you know, 50 when that happens. So, yeah, I think we're going to end up seeing um, Vladdy Guerrero is going to be a 161 player with one game t- duct taped to the bench each year. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, past that, this is interesting um, talking point I've been meaning to throw around with Brandon. You know, we're talking about maybe we're going to see less of guys hitting these numbers, but. Again, hits isn't even that big a deal. What do you think is going to be the next big milestone number for a player? Like, are we going to talk? Are we going to start talking about seventy-five WAR in this same light? Are we going to start talking about what other stat? I'm not sure which one you guys are thinking, but is there one that comes to mind that you think should be more significant in the career scale? Well, I mean, I think WAR is a big one uh, that. And I think it's very significant already, but, um, you know, you're going to have guys hit, you know, I think kind of that threshold for, for the hall of fame typically is, you know, if you're over 60 war, you're usually, unless there's, unless there's a steroid issue or a, some other ordeal going on, that's typically a, um, you know, that's typically kind of a threshold, you know, if you're over 60, you're probably going to get in. And we've got a lot of guys close to that. Andrew McCutcheon at 50.6, Yadier Molina at 55.4, Joey Votto at 58.2, Robinson Cano at 59.2. Um, you know, we got a lot of guys that are real close to that threshold. We got guys who are, have some good play left in them that are getting there, like Goldschmidt, 47, Freddie Freeman, 44, Mookie Betts, 44. So I think that 60 war, maybe it's even a 75 war, it's kind of like the 600 home run club type thing. But, um, I think that's a really cool thing. And by the way, Mike Trout already has 75 before, which is crazy. <laughs> but um, I think that's a big one. It kind of shows more of your all-around game. Um, I think that uh, one that's going to be kind of infamous, uh, we're going to have a new strikeout, you know, leader of all time, you know, in the next not far off. Um, you know, I think it's – I think definitely multiple of the guys that are playing right now will pass Reggie Jackson. Um, I forgot who the next one was probably going to be. I think it's I think John Carlos Stanton's kind of the leader in the clubhouse, but um, we, who's not even the worst strikeout hitter in baseball. So, um, but we've got. Um, I think that'll be one that we see. That's a kind of an infamously bad accomplishment, but um, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of them coming up soon. So, um, hey, Mike Trout's even on that list. You, you know, it's kind of a weird thing, but. Um, but yeah, I think that I think that probably that the war. I, I definitely agree with that. So, yeah, I would say war as well. I mean, it's. I think you're seeing it's becoming a thing all around. When we've even just seen in the CBA, they've made a rule for players, young players, getting paid based off their war. Like you're already seeing that, so I wouldn't be surprised to see it become a talking point in regular contract negotiations moving forward. Like instead of like, oh, hey, here's a uh, here's a reward for 150 innings, and then every 10 innings after that, it's gonna be like, here's a reward for if you meet 
certain war between that, you know, between these years or until this year. And then here's your incentives after everything you hit after that. Um, so I would, yeah, definitely war, I think is, is one. And for every reason Matt pretty much said as well. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll add one thing to that, uh, that war needs to be standardized for it to be a, for it to be that accomplishment where people talk about it on a consistent basis, because some people believe in baseball reference war. Some people believe in fan, fan graphs war. I'm, I'm definitely on the fan graphs war train now after the update they recently added with the outs above average from Statcast being included instead of ultimate zone rating. Um, definitely think that that's a good update, but uh, just in general, um, I think uh, I, I agree with, I agree with war being the, being the thing. So eventually. All right. Well, um, now we've certainly uh, warmed up into this show. Why don't we move into more showing the two opposite sides of this show? We'll get into more show specific type topics, a little bit of daily here, and then you guys can uh, chime in with more weekly stuff. I know you guys wanted to do like player of the week, pitcher of the week um, stuff. But let's dive into a game that's currently ongoing and currently extremely amusing to me. The White Sox tra trail the Kansas City Royals 6 nothing currently in the bottom of the seventh. Now, Chicago starts off this past week before this by dropping an entire series to Cleveland. I come out of that Cleveland series saying, look, they just got emasculated by this team. And frankly, the Twins are playing to a high enough level right now that I think that they can capitalize on the lack of momentum that Chicago has. I predicted that series sweep. A series sweep is what we got. The Chicago White Sox have now dropped seven straight games and are on their way to dropping eight straight. How are we feeling about this team right now? Uh, I can start. Um, I think that injuries are a big deal for them right now. Um, I think that, you know, if they were fully healthy, they would be doing better than they are. I mean, they're missing Moncada. Um, they're missing Lance Lynn. Um, and, you know, I think Eloy those are two big things. Eloy, yep, they're missing Eloy. Um, I think uh, I think those. I think that's a big deal. Um, you know, they, they also, I don't know why he's not in the lineup. Luis Roberts not in the lineup tonight. So that might also be a La Russa thing. But um, having, uh, you know, having Luary Garcia hitting leadoff or hitting third isn't, isn't great. But uh, they, they, their pitching's not as deep as it was last year either. You know, Carlos Rodon was legit. And, uh, you know, Dallas Keuchel is something and not in a good way. <laughs> he's walked mm -hmm. five guys tonight. I mean, he, you know, he's really struggled. That doesn't help. They're, they've been awful defensively too, um, you know, especially in the infield. Tim Anderson's really struggled at shortstop, even though he's never been a great defensive shortstop. He hadn't been this bad. Um, and, and some of that's going to be a – just a little bit of just variation. It's early, small sample size. He might go, you know, six months without or six weeks without making another error. And then it's kind of like a normal season for him, you know? So some of that small sample size, but, um, but yeah, I mean, the White Sox have been, they've been rough and they just don't seem to have it. The only thing that's, that I think is kind of a saving grace for him is that division. It's not good. There's no good teams in there. Um, you know, the twins are, are, you know, a little bit better than they were last year. And I think that they, maybe have a chance to be decent. Um, I guess they're, they, I guess the twins are leading the division right now. Um, so, I mean, they're, you know, they've been decent. They're winning right now against the Tigers tonight. Um, I still worry about that pitching, but, uh, but yeah, um, I don't know. I mean, the White Sox seem, they seem like they're having a rough time to me right now. And, you know, they need some good vibes to get a little bit better too. Yeah, and, and you didn't even mention that they're also losing or they have also lost. Um, AJ Pollock is out right he's, now. He's as back. Well. Is he back now? He's back tonight. He's playing tonight. No, oh, I didn't see him in the lineup. Uh, well, he just came back, so he's been out for the majority of this. Um, Garrett Crochet is basically undergoing Tommy yep. John as well, and he's another you know high leverage reliever that they were leaning on. Um, so a bunch of what he said. It, it's it's a small sample size, I think, to start with. The, the pitching injuries, I think, have really hurt because I think they were really relying on Giolito, who even missed some time, Lance Lynn. Um, you know, I, I did think they were going to make some sort of a move for either Manaya or Montas, and that hasn't happened to help replace the, the Rodon factor. Um, but it's a team that I, I feel like when they get going, they're going to go on an, a major run that people don't see coming because um, they, are, they are very good all around. Um, 
and the defense will improve once they get the hitters in that lineup and they all start going like that lineup's going to be nasty. Once you get Giolito, you get Lynn back, you see what Kopech, um, if you're stretching him out and what he, he's going to be, um, cause I'm really high on Michael Kopech. He's going to be a star. Cease. Yeah. Dylan Cease. Uh, we both mentioned it before when we were doing our preseason predictions, we think he could be an AL Cy Young contender this year. Like they are very, very good. It's just, they've got off to that rough start and it's the small sample size. It was just a quick thing. Was it, was that against Cleveland last week? You talk about them playing Cleveland. Was that the game that they had the wind blowing so hard that nobody could catch a pop-up on the infield? Yeah. It was like three, yeah. three straight yeah. pop-up, <clears throat> excuse me, three straight pop-ups that, that got dropped in that game. Um, And, you know, Chicago's kind of notorious for the wind factor, but I don't think I've ever seen something like that in a game. Yeah, especially on the south side. I know that, you know, the north side by the lake, they have they typically have a, you know, the real high winds like where the Cubs play, but on the south side where the where the White Sox play, I know it's windy always in Chicago or, or a lot of times in Chicago, but I don't know if I've ever seen that in a White Sox game. But anyways, I thought that was an interesting thing too. There's there's so many weird early season April type things with these places too, is kind of the point. It's like, you know, that it's hard to even count that game, you know, when it's it's kind of a random fluke game, so. Yeah, absolutely. Again, overall, my my take on this, look, you're right. It's overreacting to a small sample size. It's kind of what we have to do as um, yeah. <laughs> baseball co- uh, content creators. But at the same time, there is a story that's being told here, which time and time, we, again, we will say their manager is really freaking bad. Tony La Russa cannot be managing a major league team at this point in his life. And if he's going to be successful, if a team managed by him is going to be successful, everything has to fall into place correctly for them. And everyone has to be around him has to be able to step up, including the rotation, including the bullpen, including the lineup. And I think if they're going to be a true contender, you have to have everything firing on all cylinders. So when you see this many injuries, it's almost a blessing, I think, for that front office to see, all right, maybe the rest of this team, maybe the role players, not the star guys, maybe they aren't what we thought they were. Maybe they aren't enough to get us over that hump and really keep us in line with Tony La Rosa. Because, I mean, again, you're always going to have injuries. And so it doesn't matter if you get Garrett Crochet back. It doesn't matter if you have Joe Kelly back. It's these guys are – there's still going to be these role players that – need to be able to step up in big moments and step up in spite of Tony that they're clearly kind of showing now that they had to take on a bigger role. Maybe they're not as capable as we thought they were as for this division. If they're not as capable as they thought they were, I think the white Sox could be in real trouble. You talk about the twins, the twins are starting to add some really serious potential star power into this group. They're going to be at least solid for the next couple of years, especially if they keep Correa around the, the guardians. I mean, they have the best manager in the entire league and he's going to keep them in division races for as long as he humanly can, even if the team isn't good enough. But I think overall this pitching staff has really impressed me. The offense has gotten off to a good start so far. And then the Tigers might be my favorite young team out there. That isn't like a true contender yet. So they're, they're not in a competitive division right now, but a year or two down the line, they absolutely are. Yeah. They, they have the star power with, with Torkelson coming up. Riley Green, who I am really, really high on. Like, I think Riley Green is going to be one of the guys we're looking at in the next, you know, five years as one of the best players in baseball. Like, he he's that good, at least in my eyes. Um, so so they very much can make a run. AJ Hinch is going to be a great manager for that, for that young team. Like what he did with Houston, like we all want to make, you know, throw him under the bus for the whole sign stealing fiasco and and all of that but what he did for that houston team to get it to turn around and take that next step forward that's going to really help that young tigers team um you know the the twins i think we both had them right in in the wild card hunt this year i don't think we either picked neither of us picked them to get in but they're a team that if everything's right if you can keep buxton healthy like that they're going to be a really good team they need to figure out another like star top of the rotation pitcher um, because I don't believe Chris Paddock is very good at all. Um, Sonny Gray, he can't stay healthy. Like you're, you have Chris Archer getting you innings right now. Like that's not, that's not great. So the White Sox have, have a leeway for a run for now, but you, like you mentioned, 
they that window is is closing and they need to do something you know to to help elongate it and tony larusa should be the first one out the door to help that yeah one more one more note on the twins you're talking about their pitching uh i did want to bring up that dylan bundy's been really good so far yeah yeah he um he's been like the 2020 dylan bundy so far so you know maybe maybe that's something that'll help um it looks like he's getting the ball on the ground a lot more than he did last year and and he's he's just getting a lot more early count contact, get the ball on the ground more. So maybe he's figured something out that'll help him. You know, he was pretty good year before last. So, so it's something that he's been good before. Just just to – we'll wrap this up real quick, but just to hit on that one, they did an in-game interview with Bundy on Saturday base on the, the Saturday Fox game. Uh-huh. Um, and he really talked about how he didn't realize how much of a loss in velocity to him really mattered. And that he went his whole offseason this year to reshape his breaking balls to make them come out of the same plane or closer to his fastball to help with the lack of velocity now. Because I don't know if you've seen, he's down to like the 90. low 90s, yeah. high 80s, where he was like 97 just a couple of years ago. Um, so so that I did find that kind of interesting that, that he had went into the offseason this year around that. And I really do think that the, those are uh, sustainable uh, changes he's made. That's nice. I yeah, those are the type that. of changes that, you know, you see, and we talk about it a lot. It's a common trend where there are some guys that get better with age. It's like a, there's like some guys that are a the ba- baseball's version of wine. They just, you know, you get talk about really after I think around 32 is when that break hits for some guys and they start to lose their physical ability. Some guys sink, some guys swim, some guys fly. And you see guys like Rich Hill who have the best stretch of their career after 30. Justin like, Turner. Yep. Yeah. And Absolutely. so it's, it, it is, this very well could be that scenario for Dylan Bundy here. And so definitely something to watch out for. Absolutely. Okay, so we'll turn it over to you guys to do your thing. Um, really, I mean, we pretty much hit on everything we wanted to. Um, we can hit on a couple little things we were going to do in our, our little intro, but we can just throw them in here. Um, at least from the weekly side, just a couple of housekeeping things. They don't have to be a long thing, but um, Jacob DeGrom, he uh, had his MRI this week. I think it was actually yesterday. Um, he did get the green light to start strengthening after he had his, uh, his stress reaction in the scapula. So he will start his, uh, his buildup, at least of the strength, strengthening part of his shoulder. He's not sure when he's going to actually pick the ball back up and start throwing. Um, and then the last little thing was we had talked about Michael Conforto quite a bit about when, when and where he was going to sign. Um, he injured his shoulder in July, had a right shoulder strain. I believe he was diving for a ball in one of his camps or something. Uh, he actually ended up going season ending sh- shoulder surgery this past week. Um, so he'll, he was a guy who had qualifying offer attached to him. Nobody's going to sign him, obviously, now, so that the Mets will not get that draft pick, and he'll go into the offseason at the age of 30, um, basically coming off major shoulder surgery. Yeah, we kind of touched on the Conforto thing during today's show, and overall, my take, see what you guys think on this. This is, this is why all of these stars that hold out, you know, all these guys that think, oh, I'm worth all this money, so I'm going to haggle over, like, an extra $2 million a year. I'm going to haggle that for two months. You know, this is the exact risk you run. You go away from team trainers. You go away from team facilities and in part all of the benefits of team medical staff when you don't commit to somebody early on in the process. And this is 100% the risk you run. It's one thing to bet on yourself, but then when you, so you screw around waiting into late December, January, February to make that move, you're not, not that you're asking for this, but this is a very realistic side effect yeah and and i'll follow it up with that say hey when has this worked out really well for a player to wait super long time you know we saw it with uh craig kimbrell when he waited halfway through the season to sign with the cubs and he was absolutely horrific for for the rest of that season and most of the next year before he figured it out again uh, we talked about, uh, you know, Dallas Keuchel when he did when he went through this as his first time as a free agent. Same way, um, you look at uh, you look at Bryce Harper. Bryce Harper obviously has you know gotten really really good again, but he had a like probably the worst year of his career 
that year that he waited till almost the end of spring training to sign. So a lot of times that that really doesn't help once you sign that contract. If you've waited so long, it, it just seems like it takes a while for these players to get settled. And that and, and in some ways it, you know, like you say, just that not lack of familiar familiarity with the with the staff and the build up and the training going into the season, you know, really hurts some of these players. I think that's the real thing for sure. Absolutely. You guys got any more, any more thoughts on any of that? Um, no, again, it'll be great to see Chico de Gram. I say it time and time again, he's Brandon and my version of Pedro getting to watch him like that. Um, you know, the way that people were able to do that. That's what we were doing last year. And I was so hyped up every single time he took the mound. And now, you know, you see him time and time again with these injuries, I just want to watch the best pitcher in the world be the best pitcher in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I agree with LJ exactly. I mean, he's he's our version of our of of Pedro of of Randy Johnson. You can throw any name in there. It was must watch TV um, when he was on the mound. So glad to see him uh, getting back, especially with the Mets and how good that pitching staff has been so far this year. Every day is just another day that um, they've avoided, uh, you know, a potential catastrophe without the best pitcher in the world so that could be really scary once he gets back but um you i think we wanted to talk about uh players of the week right that's how you guys usually wrap up your show uh lj and i picked a pitcher and a hitter and uh you guys picked a pitcher and a hitter yeah so if you guys want to go ahead um we'll go ahead and, and do our pitcher second and then we'll go to our hitter and then you guys can finish it off so who'd you guys end up going with your uh your guys pitcher of the week um, just to preface a little bit, another uh, kind of plug for the bat flip side of things. Every Thursday, we do our own team of the week and our player of the week. Brandon, I believe our player of the week last week was Manny Machado. That's not where we're going to now, of course, but if that's the type of thing you're into, you want to see who performed well this week, Thursday's MLB Daily is a must. We also do power rankings on Mondays, um, if though that's also something that you're into. But Brandon... I believe we decided on Walker Bueller for our pitcher of the week. Uh, yeah, we did go with Walker Bueller. He has the complete game shutout last night against the Arizona Diamondbacks. Um, and, you know, we talked a little bit on our show today, but just how good the guy has been over the last few seasons. I mean, he had like a sneaky 2.47 ERA in over 200 innings last year, and it seemed like he wasn't really talked about that much. Like, sure, he was in the contention for Cy Young, and people were kind of bringing his name up, but there's just so much star power on that Dodgers team um, that, that overshadows him. So, you know, I felt like we had to give him his due. The first complete game of the season, the first shutout of the season um, by any pitcher. So really nice to see him um, have a great game against what is just a pathetic uh, Diamondbacks uh, offense. Yeah, that game as a Dodger fan, selfishly, was really fun to watch. Um, you know, him going into the dugout after the eighth inning. I don't know if you guys saw Dave Roberts' press conference after the game. And he basically told Walker as he was walking by, like, hey, that's it. And Walker turned around to him and said, I'm not coming out of this effing game. Um, and then basically, like, he told him, like, hey, you're going to go 110 pitches. And then he looked at him after he gave up a single and was like, don't, don't you dare come out here. Um, so that was pretty fun. And you mentioned his sneaky 2021. Like, he should have been in it. And the only thing that hurt him is in the month of September, he had a 483 ERA. So uh, every other month, you know, he started March and April with a 316. Every other month was a 218 or lower. And nobody really talked about it. It was Corbin Burns, Zach Wheeler, um, and even Julio Urias for a while, which is weird because sure, he was Scherzer his teammate. Too. Scherzer. Um, but, yeah, he, he really did fly under the radar. I don't know. I do want to talk. To, I did want to talk a lot about his postseason performance, but uh, oh, well, look. that's for a different, <laughs> that's for a different day. All right, go talk about Eddie Rosario getting eye surgery. All right, just I'll talk, about his, I'll talk about his postseason performance too. Yeah, yeah, um, really about that. <laughs> yeah so it's just it, the National League is so tough. We were talking about this earlier as well, um, or yesterday now, but it's one of those things where I feel like no one's going to get their just due in the National League for a very long time. Because not only is his team stacked with guys who deserve to be in that conversation, but you look at the NL East, you look at Milwaukee. I mean, really, I think between 
LA, the majority of Cy Youngs for the next several years are going to be between Milwaukee, LA, New York, and Philadelphia. I think that's a very fair situation to say. That's going to be where the bulk of that conversation is going to surround. And that's without talking about guys who could easily slip into that. Carlos Rodon could easily slip into that. Alcantara. Um, Alcantara. Yeah. Max Fried. I lo- love that. But- yep. Exactly. There's just there's too much pitching in the National League right now for anyone to get their fair say. Absolutely. Uh, so for our pitcher of the week, and I'll say it and let Matt delve deeper into it, but we ended up going with the uh, kind of the layup with Shohei Otani. Yeah, just I was I was actually a uh, you know, Wednesday nights. I'm in a bowling league, and I was actually at the bowling alley when Shohei was pitching this week, and. Uh, he, uh, I kept looking at my phone and I was like, my God, is this a, is this a glitch? Like, is this, act, is this real? And every, cause every time it kept putting up, but every time I'd look down, he'd have three more strikeouts. And I was like, man, he ended up with, uh, you know, pitching. He only pitched one game this week, which, you know, I like to go with two start pitchers most of the time because they have a little more volume. They've done a little bit more, but Shohei was still the number three pitcher based on fan graphs war on the week, even with only six innings and, and one start, but he had a perfect game through five. He, he ended up with six innings pitched uh, 12 strikeouts. Um, he gave up one hit and one walk. Um, and the guy is just incredible. And that's on top of hitting, which he didn't hit very well this week, but um you know, that game, I think he was two for three with a double or two doubles or something. And like, he, he just, it's, it's, it's amazing to watch what he could do. And honestly, you know, last year, obviously he was unbelievable at the plate and I thought he was a really good pitcher, but that there were still some improvements he could make on the mound. And he looks to be a better pitcher this year than he was last year, which is scary. So, um, you know, Shohei Otani, there's not a lot more to say about him. He's just incredible. Yeah, and the, the big thing about that game, too, is you mentioned the six innings with 12 strikeouts. His pitch count was only 81. Yeah. Like, he could have easily had another inning or two in him, but they were just playing it cautious. Like, because that was basically that his other pitch counts were 80 and 70. So and as they like, should, too, yeah. because, like, from my perspective, I will never pick Shohei Otani to win the MVP. Because, well, first off, it's not good odds. But um, he should be. <laughs> the MVP like every single year, if he keeps doing what he's capable of doing, but I physically cannot understand in my head. I don't understand how he can do the workload that he is doing currently and stay healthy for an entire career. Like that just, it fascinates me that he's able to do it for one season, but I will never be able to pick him because I can't guarantee that he's going to be able to stay healthy like that. So I'll always be uh, better safe off than sorry with this guy. Yeah, the, the thing I think that does help him is that even when we saw him having the, the you know, elbow issues on the pitching side and he went to become a full DH that one year, like he was still a really good full-time just DH even. Like you could make even an argument that he was he was one of the best hitters then even, you know. Like I, I'm surprised that he's able to put up the, the numbers he can on both sides of the ball just because of that. Like – the, the art of being able to be a pitcher itself, like we see pe- people struggle with it, it in itself and then not let alone a guy also be able to hit, you know, 40 something homers on top of that with the 250 average and just be absolutely insane, you know, offensively when we see guys who, you know, look at the most of 2021 and the struggle Cody Bellinger went through, who's a former MVP himself, like, and he's just now kind of getting his own hitting zone back. To see a guy like Otani, no matter what he's been going through, to be able to play well on both sides of the ball, either way, that's fascinating. But uh, we'll go ahead and we'll jump over to our hitters, and then we'll let you guys kind of finish up with your hitter of the week. Um, for our hitter of the week, we ended up going with Ty France. Um, led the league on the hitting side in war this week with .8, um, you know, leading with his, uh, his five-hit game on – Saturday that had a, a homer, five RBIs, and then he came back Sunday, had another three hit game and five at bats with another homer and two RBIs. Um, I've mentioned a lot about Ty France. He's always been one of my sneaky underrated guys um, in for the past couple of seasons, even when he was with the Padres and wasn't getting much play in time. This guy can hit like he might not be the greatest fielder, but he always finds a way to get to make an impact offensively. Yeah, I mean, Ty France, 
has been has been really good. I mean, he could just hit the ball really hard, you know. And and this week, I mean, hitting 500 over a week is is tough to do. Um, you know, he's he's and he really helped them win a couple games too. I think he pretty much single handedly won one game against uh, against Texas. I was watching on I think it was on MLB Network. So it's a really good week for him. Yeah, yeah so I like. Who do you go for him? Oh, um, I just like overall the balance that this Seattle team has between the established guys and the young, young guys, because you have guys like uh, J.P. Crawford, Eugenio Suarez, Jesse Winker, Ty France, who've been around for at least a minute or at least understand what's going on. Like they, they get it. Meanwhile, you've got the Julio Rodriguez is the Jared Kalnick's of the world who are still trying to grow into that major league role. So while it's still a young team, they have a good balance where they all they don't play too young. They have a young pitching staff development too. Like there's like three of their minor league arms right now that I am really excited looking forward to coming up this year. Yeah, and you bring up uh, Eugenio Suarez. Uh, you know that was a guy that I had kind of penciled in as a bounce back candidate. He's been really good so far this year. He's got a 271 average, 377 on base, 525 slugging. That's a 173 WRC plus. Uh, he's a guy that I think um, you know he he had a, he had two really unlucky seasons. I know he struck out a lot over the last two years, but in his career he had a he had never had a sub 300 batting average on balls in play until 2020. In 2020 it was 214. 2021 it was 224. I know his batted ball profile wasn't as good those two years, but that is a enormous drop in, in batting average on balls in play this year. Well, it's right back up into the 300s. So uh, he's been really good. He, he's also, you know, playing a pretty good def- defense too. I mean, he always has. So, um, you know, this is a guy who really is helping the, um, you know, who really is helping the Mariners when a lot of people kind of thought he was a throw in in the Jesse Winker trade, maybe even to get rid of a bad contract. So I think this is a this this is a really good piece in that trade. Well, LJ, who did we go with for our hitter I'm of the let week? You introduce it because I want to talk it. All right. Well, we went with Wander Franco. He's got, uh, I believe, two home runs tonight, or hit a home run tonight. Um, as oh my God, Anthony Rizzo just hit another home run. He's got three tonight. Uh, him and Judge just went back to back. But we go with Wander Franco, who um, for the bat flip listeners this is possibly lj's favorite player in the league um already second, second favorite player in the league second favorite player in the league I gotta, gotta give respect to xander but um no this dude is freaking awesome um i'm gonna glow about him because you know what probably next time we do this brandon's gonna get to go off about basically any of his um east asian born players his hasan kim his Seiya suzuki his shohei otani um but yeah, I mean, this is just, he, he is the future of this league. You're talking about a guy, half war, half of war over the last seven games before um, Tuesday night, three home runs, then adding more in even now. You're talking about a guy with a four and a half percent strikeout rate over the week. And that's, that's not abnormal for this guy. His lowest, um, excuse me, highest career strikeout rate. The only time he struck out more than he walked in his entire minor league, major league career was his first year in the majors. And it was barely like it was a very slight increment here. So I think this is a guy he's going to be special. He's going to do a lot for the Rays team. It, it says a lot that the Rays were willing to pay him. Like that shows you how good this guy is, how good this guy is going to be. He's going to go down as the best Ray of all time. He's going to go down as one of my favorite players of all the time, and he might go down as the best eye in at least recent baseball history, if not baseball history. Yeah, Wander is going to be special. Um, yeah, he, he and really it's, is. It's, it's rare you get a prospect that was as highly rated as him that comes up and proves it right away and backs up everything that anyone said. Uh, so, and I know we were talking about it, that he's going to be one of the ones to, to make 3000 hits. So if that's, you know, that's just another push in the record of like how good we think he really is and how good he, we think he's going to elevate to over his career. Absolutely. Yeah. I, yeah. yeah. He, he really is. And I, I did want to bring, if you mentioned the Anthony Rizzo home run, if you want to guess the distance on it, uh, it it's kind of funny. 
I'm gonna guess. Let's see. So I saw I was right down the right field line. Uh, I'm gonna guess like what, like three, three, sixteen, because it hit the top of the wall. Three, three, twenty-seven. It was a ninety-nine <laughs> exit velocity, forty-eight degree launch angle. <laughs> yeah, it was a moonshot. I didn't think it was getting out when he it, hit. I'm surprised you didn't. That's it's 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 nuts. It would have been a pop out. It would have been listed a pop out in any other ballpark. <laughs> Oh yeah, boy! Yeah, here we go. Not here even, we not, even a, the, not even a fly out. Close for the. Uh, we got to do a plug, even though it's not for anything belly up sports related. Uh, Twitter account would it dong is going to have a field day with Anthony that, Rizzo's home. Now I will say that one was so close to the line that might have been a home run at Fenway too it, because of the pesky four. pool. It was four ballparks. Yeah, I was going to say it was so close to the line that it, it might have been a home run at some others. But yeah, Fenway being one for sure. But I don't know about the others. Um, well, all right, guys. Um, do, I think we we touched on just about everything we could. We hit on some big issues, some more day to day issues. This was certainly great sitting down to talk with you guys. Uh, we'll plug our stuff real quick. Of course, at MLB Daily Pod on Twitter, TikTok, any any social media. Be sure to check us out. Uh, we're posting a daily content on TikTok. Um, we you know we've kind of moved over there i post a video every day with two key takeaways from the previous night's games lj is active on the twitter so am i um so you can uh, certainly go check us out there and then i guess uh likewise you guys can plug whatever you want for our show yeah so we have a uh, a twitter as well um at batflip podcast um i just started actually an instagram page that we are branching out to trying to get interactive there uh, and then we are starting to upload the podcast, not video version, but just the audio version to YouTube um, as well. Um, those are all at just the Batflip podcast. Um, and just kind of, you know, trying to grow that brand that way. Absolutely. Well, uh, guys, thank you for joining us. Uh, we certainly had a pleasure joining you as well. This will certainly be great. Uh, this simulcast on both shows tomorrow. Um, we had a blast, but uh, yeah, thanks for joining us. Be sure to check out the Batflip podcast. Check us out. And uh, yeah, we will see you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you. All. Thank you all yeah. for, for coming on with us. So yeah, it's fun. Been really fun. All right. Uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Have a good one. All right. Well, we are back to just me and Matt here. Um, hope you guys enjoyed that episode with the MLB Daily guys. It's always a treat to get to talk to them um, and give the daily side of kind of the, the season. It's a little different look at how they see things, to how we see it. Um, pretty good conversation and uh, back and forth about the uh, the lockout with the and the, the rule changes. Uh, you know, looking forward. Um, bunch of different opinions that you guys usually don't get between me and matt we seem to to generally agree on most of the stuff but what were your uh, your kind of takeaways from that one yeah it was a good conversation um always enjoy talking to them um they're definitely very knowledgeable about baseball uh i, I really admire their uh, consistency doing that show every single day that, that's really tough to do but um but yeah um you know they have some good opinions and and it's a good conversation we always like to bring in different ideas and have some some real discussion on here there was definitely some real discussion with them on some of the rule changes opinions about some of the players that we talk about and of course you know they like Wander franco a lot so i think we can agree on a lot of things so um that's definitely one to agree on but um you know, I, I definitely uh, think it's always good to branch out and, and, and have some discussion. That's one of the things that makes baseball so great is a lot of sports. There's not all that much discussion to be had. Yeah, everyone knows so-and-so is great. But baseball, there's so many discussion points because it's such a statistic-based sport that, you know, what stats are important, what stats aren't. You know, what's important to grow the game, what's not. Like, there's so many different things that are important for, for baseball that I think it's always great to have different opinions, perspectives, and I, th I had a lot of fun talking to them. And, uh, you know, we talked a little bit about maybe making this a more regular thing, you know, having having both having both shows get together for a, uh, you know, for joint episodes every, every so often. So I definitely look forward to that. Yeah, they are. They're really knowledgeable. And like you said, I, uh, you know, being able to do that show every single day and, and a consistent like half hour show every day, that is something. I mean, we can barely get together half the time on a week basis, um, let alone every single day. Um, 
But, you know, Brandon and LJ, they do a great job. You guys should go look at all their social medias at MLB Daily. Um, I think they said they're on Twitter, TikTok, uh, daily TikToks, which, you know, that's kind of surprising to me. But, uh, you know, did you know of anyone else that they mentioned, uh, the social media platforms at least, that they're on? Uh, I don't think so. They plugged it in the end of the Yeah, they did in that one as well. So. Um, so it was a really fantastic conversation. I hope you guys enjoyed. Hope we get some uh, some really good feedback from it. Um, and that will pretty much wrap it up for this episode of the Batfoot Podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in, and we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, everybody.